Good morning. I am going to run through this lesson plan template. Um, this is ele ele elementary, excuse me, middle and secondary alternative certificate programs. So because this is an early childhood setting, um, some of this isn't going to be applicable. So I'm just going to say that right off the bat. I'm going to ask about this for you all, but in the meantime, I'm going to fill one out to show you how it's done since um, some of you have asked about this and it seems like this might be helpful at least to get started. Um, so you'll write your name, obviously, school and date of observation. So on the date of observation, you would put the date that I was scheduled to come. Um, and then brief overview of what will be taught in the unit. So the unit is the broader um, context. So let's say you were doing, um, I recently um, saw a lesson that was about origami. So maybe the unit, I don't know this, but maybe the unit was, um, you know, um, crafts of other cultures or something like that. So I don't know what your units are. If you don't have units um, that are connected to the lessons you have to teach, uh, don't worry about it. Just leave NA, not applicable there, and don't worry about it at all. Your lesson title, like for this one, would have been Moragami. Um, it was the name of the book, I think. Whatever the lesson title is, is it doesn't really matter, to be honest. Just give it a title if you don't have one. Because I know you all are working on lessons that you've been given for the most part. So just put the title of whatever lesson you were given. And then a brief description of what you'll do. So in this one, the teacher, um, teacher will read book. And then you put the book name in there. Um, class will move to small groups. Oops at tables, table one, folding paper, table two, decorating the origami creation, markers, etc. That's it. That's all you need to put. Um, so then, um, oh, and will you put read book in whole group? Sorry about that. <laughs> Basically, you just want to give a picture of how this flows. Um, then you put the age grade of the students. So we're early childhood, three to five. Okay, number of students. Let's say you have 18 total. How many with an IEP? Lately, you guys have had, we never had more than, we didn't even have IEPs in early childhood for a long time. Just so you know how crazy this has gotten for you. Um, now you might have as many as eight or nine or up. Oop, not 89. <laughs> okay, number of gifted students. Um, that wouldn't apply here. Uh, students who are learning English, who we now call multilingual. Um, just put the number, say you have three students, um, one Spanish speaking, one Kinyarwanda, and one, um, we'll put Arabic. Okay, so you just put the number of children and what languages are spoken. Um, if you don't know, that's something you should find out. Um, describe the students in your classroom. So this is just a, um, you know, a standard description. Um, I have one student who is um, working closely with an aid assigned to them for success. I have five students who are highly, highly engaged, etc. Okay, you get the idea, blah, 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 blah. This is very brief. They didn't give you much space, and that's why, because they just want a brief description. Um, 
You could have, you know, I have a child in a wheelchair and so on and so forth. We're not going to worry about national standards. There really aren't any for early childhood, but the state standards are in this website. Let me show you. I'm going to move my screen. The um, I'm going to go back so you can see Governor's Office of Early Childhood, Early Childhood Standards. You want to make sure, oops, you want to make sure you get the ones from 2021 on because they're very different. And you'll see this is a gigantic PDF. So you want to fast forward through to ages three to four, which if you scroll down, you've got birth to three and then three and four year olds will come sometime soon, hopefully, because I'm scrolling here and it's boring for you, but you get the idea. You can go through and here we go, three and four year olds. So you can see benchmark one maintains focus and sustains attention. This one would actually work for this lesson because folding origami <coughs> by directions is kind of odd to ask a child this age to do, but it was in the curriculum this teacher had to do. So where do we go? Okay, so you're gonna put um, this benchmark standard in here. That's where you'll put that. All you have to do is list the benchmark 1.1 maintains focus and sustains attention. That's all you have to put there. So you would put that there. Then um, identify previous lessons, learning targets and objectives. So um, you could write here um, in the past lessons, students have been cutting and pasting, oh, not pasting, gluing, <laughs> sorry, gluing, cutting and gluing paper, drawing on paper. This is their first folding experience, okay? So you get a, you know, this is what they've done with paper before. This is the first time they're going to fold. Um, so now you're going to identify your targets and objectives that you want to assess. So anytime you have a target or an objective, a goal, you have to know how to, you're going to assess it. So if we, if our target is that they're going to, um, students will maintain focus in order to fold in a three-step direction process to make an origami figure. So there you go. So you have to just t say this is, you include that standard that you were talking about um, and how, you're, how they're going to do it. Like how are you going to observe it? So I can fold an origami um, figure, sorry, I had to think for a minute, um, using three step directions, period. Um, you could say again, they've done this before with paper, they know how to cut, they know how to glue on paper, they know how to draw on paper, now they're going to learn to make something by folding paper, right? The resources you need are, you know, and then you list all your resources. You need that book, Morigami, to do this. I think this is how you spell it. I can't remember, but you get the idea. Then identify physical materials. Then obviously you just list all the materials you're going to have at the table. Um, any technology or website. So let's say you decide to show them pictures of origami on the big smart board then you could put that. You don't have to put anything here. You could put, you just leave it, put not applicable or whatever. So lesson procedure. So this is where you just literally break down what you're going to do. You notice how it has multiple steps in that chart. So this is what it might look like. Um, students will gather on the rug using our um, circle time song, okay? Uh, questions and answers. 
modifications. So you might put, you know, um, aid will monitor student who has challenges coming to whole group. Like you might put that in there. So put everything in there you know you're going to need to think about in order for this to happen. Anticipated time, um, I would hope it's no longer than a minute. <laughs> that would be a long time to wait for everybody to get to the rug. By then, everybody will be jumping up and down. So, But let's just say it's one minute. Then you say, um, teacher will hold up book for the circle time. And maybe you would ask um, some questions like, so what does everybody notice about the cover of the book, of the book, etc. So you keep going like that. You're going to break this thing down into its parts because when you do that, a lot of times you'll go, oh, wait a minute. I didn't think about that. <laughs> right? So go through this whole thing step by step by step by step. And next you get to your assessments. Most of the time, summative assessments are really not done in early childhood unless they're a child's being evaluated or something. So a formative assessment is just something informal. It says formative, it sounds formal, but it's not. It's the opposite. And you may already know that. I'm not sure what you've been, you know, what's been uh, given to you by way of using this document. So a formative assessment is something that allows you to document without a lot of paperwork, without a lot of, you're not going to ask the children questions or te it's not a testing thing. It's a, what did you notice they did? So in this case, you would have the origami figures that they made as your formative assessment. So what you would put is work samples will be used to assess and then, you know, um, how well student could follow three step folding directions. Because if you have a student who, for example, when I observed this lesson, there was a child sitting next to me, not at the small group tables, and this child was folding totally different paper that I gave him <laughs> because he was having a hard time, so I was helping the teacher out. And he was folding it more like an accordion, you know, like a fan. Um, and he was folding it many, many, many times to do that. So he was actually doing way more than was needed for the origami session. Um, and he was not following a directive. So it's an interesting thing when you have a child who is showing you with their folding activity, I can't attend to the directions you're giving me. You're asking me to come to a group and listen to a book. You're asking me to come to the table and do a process with a group of children. Clearly this child is not there, which is fine. It's not a problem. Um, however, it's noteworthy that follow, folding directions, I can fold, but I don't fold in the way you've asked me to but I don't do anything in the way you've asked me to. So it's consistent. Um, it's not a judgment. It's not, you know, this is a problem child or anything of that nature. He's a very creative child, actually. I've noted that in my visits. <laughs> He's a wonderful child. Um, and, you know, school is gonna be a challenge for him because he's so creative. <laughs> so, you know, we all know that exists. Um, I hope he finds classrooms where he can be accommodated like he is in this one because the teacher's wonderful about just letting him, you know, he's four, let him be. <laughs> so the point is though that you can see how these work samples are really often representative of how the child is in the world, in, in your classroom. So you work samples are a great thing to use. Um, if you're playing a game, you can just notice you can, you can even, you know, have 
um, a little checklist with the names of the children who are going to play the game and then just make little notes to yourself afterwards about who was able to do the game and you know what parts of the game were challenging just tiny little notes like that that's a formative assessment if you need my help coming up with one um, I'm happy to do that with you then we get to culturally responsive instruction so in terms of cultural responsiveness basically you want to ask yourself did I keep in mind in my interactions during this lesson the cultural background of every child in my room what is the cultural background of every child in your room rather than look at it in terms of you know I have this many children who are um, of Asian descent or you know the typical ways we think of culture think of culture as the homes they come from what if it, if you have a child in your room who wears a hijab and is a Muslim um, girl if that's how that family identifies it doesn't mean that that family is going to be the same as every other Muslim family in the community that Muslim family will observe their faith and their culture in their own way as we all do so you want to just really think about that as culturally responsive um, in this case you're introducing them to something called origami which is which comes from another country far far away and you could just say that you know you wanted to introduce them to origami as another way of making something you know we make things all the time in preschool um, and you make things you make things when you draw and you paint and you create so you know this is the way children in another country might make something they might fold paper to make something so that's a really simple way of putting that um, if you're playing a game and and sometimes the games have right and wrong answers in them which you have to be flexible about because not every child has the same life experience they bring to that game so I remember for example when I was teaching math in in fifth grade and I was preparing kids for those standardized tests we were reading those questions to practice and of course you know we all know those tests are kind of <laughs> they are what they are and there was a um, sto math story problem that talked about a veranda a veranda right and all these kids I knew they knew how to do the math problem part of the story but they were not doing it and I thought okay I'm gonna say how many of you know what a porch is <laughs> and I'll say a porch a veranda is a porch and then they could all do the math problem <laughs> so you know that's a culturally responsive um, approach so if that gives you an idea too so just put one thing here that's plenty um, you can leave this content area standard behind because you're not doing that that's for older children and then you can look at your assessment and see how many of them were able to do it how many of them did it far more and how many of them just didn't do it at all or participate when I, when I what I like to tell my students is below should just mean didn't participate um, we should not be evaluating preschoolers quality of work <laughs> okay so just think of it that way um, then you look at how successful the lesson was and I'm just gonna say that in preschool the success of a lesson is just that you did something with the children it was joyful it was wonderful those children who chose to participate had fun and enjoyed the process right so let's don't get involved in what skills they got out of it okay just um, say how you know I feel like all of the children that wanted to fold origami got a chance to do that and they enjoyed the book they were responsive during the reading of the book um, you know and so on so basically um, here's here's one that you would this is where you would say what you were gonna share the work samples is what you would share in that case um, 
if it was if you were playing a game, um, you you could just let the observer watch the game and maybe share your checklist or just have a discussion of what you noticed. Um, and so here's, you know, what to what extent did procedures, etc. So if you had a child during the time you were trying to do this who was having a hard time, you could just put that. Um, we're not blaming this child. We're not saying they're, they ruined my lesson. <laughs> it's more, we just note, hey, there were these things going on. Did you depart from your plan? If so, how and why? That's legitimate. So if you totally changed what you were doing because of maybe what's going on up here, <laughs> then that's fair. Um, if you had the opportunity to teach the lesson again, what would you do differently? If you would, just mention that. Um, what professional growth pieces do you have? And I would say that for new students writing lesson plans, it would just be the process of writing a lesson plan and then implementing it. Um, so sometimes it can be really confusing because you think, okay, I'm going to do something and then write it up, which is totally legitimate. Now, some principals will not let you do that. They're going to make you turn in a lesson plan. They're going to watch you do it to see if you do it. And, and then you can put in here how you changed it and why. So just know that going into it, you should sketch out. If you, if you have a principal that doesn't push you to turn things in ahead of time and then be observed, which is very unusual, I'll just say that. Um, I personally prefer to do lesson planning that way. If I was your principal, that's how I would have you do it. I would have you sketch in pencil. Here's kind of what I think I'm going to do. And then type it up and say, okay, I thought this is what I was going to do, but this is what actually happened. And um, so that's something to just think about. How um, were the learning results communicated to students? Um, this is mostly for older kids. Um, but, you know, it's good for young children here. I say, wow, I noticed you did this when you folded the paper. I noticed you were able to fold the paper three times the way I asked, the way the directions from the origami um, book said to. What I want to say is that I don't want praise to be going on. Praise is empty. It doesn't really tell the child. I hear people saying, good job. So let's take good job out. Of, we teach this in our courses at U of L. Take it out of the equation and start telling kids, I noticed what you did and not evaluate it as good or not good or just, I noticed you. I saw you. I see what you did, right? Like just as a way of affirming the child and letting them know they're seen by the people who are working with them. Um, and if you had um, needs and experiences, for example, this teacher could write in here that um, they allowed this student that I told you about to sit at another table and fold paper that was different and fold in the way that made sense to them. And that was meeting that child's need. Um, so I hope this has been helpful. Um, I don't want you to get too bogged down in the correctness of it. This is your first time doing it. So um, I just want to be helpful in, in a way that allows you to feel kind of like you can work your way through this. Um, and you'll get better and better and better at it. You'll write them in your sleep by the time you're done. <laughs>